Chapter Four: Moses in Egypt, Part One of the Legends of the Jews, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rhonda Fetterman. The Legends of the Jews, Volume Two, by Rabbi Louis Ginsburg. The Beginning of the Egyptian Bondage. As soon as Jacob was dead, the eyes of the Israelites were closed, as well as their hearts. They began to feel the dominion of the stranger, although real bondage did not enslave them until some time later. While a single one of the sons of Jacob was alive, the Egyptians did not venture to approach the Israelites with evil intent. It was only when Levi, the last of them, had departed this life that their suffering commenced. A change in the relation of the Egyptians towards the Israelites had, indeed, been noticeable immediately after the death of Joseph, but they did not throw off their mask completely until Levi was no more. Then the slavery of the Israelites supervened in good earnest. The first hostile act on the part of the Egyptians was to deprive the Israelites of their fields, their vineyards, and the gifts that Joseph had sent to his brethren. Not content with these animosities, they sought to do them harm in other ways. The reason for the hatred of the Egyptians was envy and fear. The Israelites had increased to a miraculous degree. At the death of Jacob, the seventy persons he had brought down with him had grown to the number of six hundred thousand, and their physical strength and heroism were extraordinary and therefore alarming to the Egyptians. There were many occasions at that time for the display of prowess. Not long after the death of Levi occurred that of the Egyptian king Magron, who had been bred up by Joseph, and therefore was not wholly without grateful recollection of what he and his family had accomplished for the welfare of Egypt. But his son and successor Malol, together with his whole court, knew not the sons of Jacob and their achievements and they did not scruple to oppress the Hebrews. The final breach between them and the Egyptians took place during the wars waged by Malal against Zepho, the grandson of Esau. In the course of it the Israelites had saved the Egyptians from a crushing defeat, but instead of being grateful they sought only the undoing of their benefactors, from fear that the giant strength of the Hebrews might be turned against them. The Legends of the Jews, Volume 2, by Rabbi Louis Ginsburg. Pharaoh's Cunning The counselors and elders of Egypt came to Pharaoh, and spake unto him, saying, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are greater and mightier than we. Thou hast seen their strong power, which they have inherited from their fathers. For a few of them stood up against a people as many as the sand of the sea and not one hath fallen. Now therefore give us counsel what to do with them, until we shall gradually destroy them from among us, lest they become too numerous in the land. For if they multiply, and there falleth out any war, they will also join themselves with their great strength unto our enemies, and fight against us, destroy us from the land, and get them up out of the land." The king answered the elders, saying, This is the plan advised by me against Israel, from which we will not depart. Behold, Pithom and Ramses are cities not fortified against battle. It behooves us to fortify them. Now, go ye and act cunningly against the children of Israel, and proclaim in Egypt and in Goshen, saying, All ye men of Egypt, Goshen, and Pathros. The king has commanded us to build Pithom and Ramses and fortify them against battle. Those amongst you, in all Egypt, of the children of Israel and of all the inhabitants of the cities, who are willing to build with us, shall have their wages given to them daily at the king's order. Then go ye first, and begin to build Pithom and Ramses, and cause the king's proclamation to be made daily, 
and when some of the children of Israel come to build, do ye give them their wages daily? And after they shall have built with you for their daily wages, draw yourselves away from them day by day, and one by one, in secret. Then you shall rise up and become their taskmasters and their officers, and you shall have them afterward to build without wages. And should they refuse, then force them with all your might to build. If you do this, it will go well with us, for we shall cause our land to be fortified after this manner, and with the children of Israel it will go ill, for they will decrease in number on account of the work, because you will prevent them from being with their wives. The elders, the counsellors, and the whole of Egypt did according to the word of the king. For a month the servants of Pharaoh built with Israel, then they withdrew themselves gradually, while the children of Israel continued to work, receiving their daily wages, for some men of Egypt were still carrying on the work with them. After a time all the Egyptians had withdrawn, and they had turned to become the officers and taskmasters of the Israelites. Then they refrained from giving them any pay and when some of the Hebrews refused to work without wages, their taskmasters smote them, and made them return by force to labor with their brethren. And the children of Israel were greatly afraid of the Egyptians, and they came again and worked without pay, all except the tribe of Levi, who were not employed in the work with their brethren. The children of Levi knew that the proclamation of the king was made to deceive Israel, Therefore they refrained from listening to it, and the Egyptians did not molest them later, since they had not been with their brethren at the beginning, and though the Egyptians embittered the lives of the other Israelites with servile labor, they did not disturb the children of Levi. The Israelites called Malol, the king of Egypt, Maror, bitterness because in his days the Egyptians embittered their lives with all manner of rigorous service. But Pharaoh did not rest satisfied with his proclamation and the affliction it imposed upon the Israelites. He suspended a brick press from his own neck, and himself took part in the work at Pithom and Ramses. After this, whenever a Hebrew refused to come and help with the building, alleging that he was not fit for such hard service. The Egyptians would retort, saying, Dost thou mean to make us believe thou art more delicate than Pharaoh? The king himself urged the Israelites on with gentle words, saying, My children, I beg you to do this work and erect these buildings for me. I will give you great reward, therefore. By means of such artifices and wily words, the Egyptians succeeded in overmastering the Israelites, and once they had them in their power, they treated them with undisguised brutality. Women were forced to perform men's work, and men women's work. The building of Pithom and Ramses turned out no advantage to the Egyptians, for scarcely were the structures completed when they collapsed, or they were swallowed by the earth, and the Hebrew workmen, besides having to suffer hardships during their erection, lost their lives by being precipitated from enormous heights when the buildings fell in a heap. But the Egyptians were little concerned whether or not they derived profit from the forced labor of the children of Israel. Their main object was to hinder their increase, and Pharaoh therefore issued an order that they were not to be permitted to sleep at their own homes, so that they might be deprived of the opportunity of having intercourse with their wives. The officers executed the will of the king, telling the Hebrews that the reason was the loss of too much time in going to and fro, which would prevent them from completing the required tale of bricks. Thus the Hebrew husbands were kept apart from their wives, and they were compelled to sleep on the ground away from their habitations. But God spake, saying, Unto their father Abraham I gave the promise, 
that I would make his children to be as numerous as the stars in the heavens, and you contrive plans to prevent them from multiplying? We shall see whose word will stand, mine or yours. And it came to pass that the more the Egyptians afflicted them, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. And they continued to increase in spite of Pharaoh's command, that those who did not complete the required tale of bricks were to be immured in the buildings between the layers of bricks. And great was the number of Israelites that lost their lives in this way. Many of their children were, besides, slaughtered as sacrifices to the idols of the Egyptians. For this reason, God visited retribution upon the idols at the time of the going forth of the Israelites from Egypt. They had caused the death of the Hebrew children, and in turn they were shattered, and they crumbled into dust. The Legends of the Jews, Volume 2, by Rabbi Louis Ginsburg The Pious Midwives when now, in spite of all their tribulations, the children of Israel continued to multiply and spread abroad, so that the land was full of them as with thick underbrush, for the women brought forth many children at a birth, the Egyptians appeared before Pharaoh again and urged him to devise some other way of ridding the land of the Hebrews, seeing that they were increasing mightily, though they were made to toil and hard labor. Pharaoh could invent no new design. He asked his counselors to give him their opinions of the thing. Then spake one of them, Job of the land of Uz, which is in Aram Naharaim, as follows. The plan which the king invented, of putting a great burden of work upon the Israelites, was good in its time, and it should be executed henceforth too, but to secure us against the fear that, if a war should come to pass, they may overwhelm us by reason of their numbers, and chase us forth out of the land. Let the king issue a decree that every male child of the Israelites shall be killed at his birth. Then we need not be afraid of them if we should be overtaken by war. Now let the king summon the Hebrew midwives, that they come hither, and let him command them in accordance with this plan. Job's advice found favor in the eyes of Pharaoh and the Egyptians. They preferred to have the midwives murder the innocents, for they feared the punishment of God if they laid hands upon them themselves. Pharaoh cited the two midwives of the Hebrews before him and commanded them to slay all men children, but to save the daughters of the Hebrew women alive for the Egyptians were as much interested in preserving the female children as in bringing about the death of the male children. They were very sensual, and were desirous of having as many women as possible at their service. However, the plan, even if it had been carried into execution, was not wise, for though a man may marry many wives, each woman can marry but one husband. Thus a diminished number of men and a corresponding increase in the number of women did not constitute so serious a menace to the continuance of the nation of the Israelites as the reverse case would have been. The two Hebrew midwives were Jochebed, the mother of Moses, and Miriam, his sister. When they appeared before Pharaoh, Miriam exclaimed, Woe be to this man when God visits retribution upon him for his evil deeds. The king would have killed her for these audacious words, had not Jochebed allayed his wrath by saying, Why dost thou pay heed to her words? She is but a child, and knows not what she speaks. Yet, although Miriam was but five years old at the time, she nevertheless accompanied her mother and helped her with her offices to the Hebrew women, giving food to the newborn babes while Jochebed washed and bathed them. Pharaoh's order ran as follows. At the birth of the child, if it be a man-child, kill it. If it be a female child, then you need not kill it, 
but you may save it alive. The midwives returned. How are we to know whether the child is male or female? For the king had bidden them kill it while it was being born. Pharaoh replied, If the child issues forth from the womb with its face foremost, it is a man-child, for it looks to the earth whence man was taken. But if its feet appear first, it is a female, for it looks up towards the rib of the mother, and from a rib woman was made. The king used all sorts of devices to render the midwives amenable to his wishes. He approached them with amorous proposals, which they both repelled, and then he threatened them with death by fire. But they said within themselves, Our father Abraham opened an inn, that he might feed the wayfarers, though they were heathen, and we should neglect the children, nay, kill them? No, we shall have a care to keep them alive. Thus they failed to execute what Pharaoh had commanded. Instead of murdering the babes, they supplied all their needs. If a mother that had given birth to a child lacked food and drink, the midwives went to well-to-do women and took up a collection, that the infant might not suffer want. They did still more for the little ones. They made supplication to God, praying, Thou knowest that we are not fulfilling the words of Pharaoh, but it is our aim to fulfill thy words. O oh, that it be thy will, our Lord, to let the child come into the world safe and sound, lest we fall under the suspicion that we tried to slay it, and maimed it in the attempt. The Lord hearkened to their prayer, and no child born under the ministrations of Shifra and Pua, or Jochebed and Miriam, as the midwives are also called, came into the world lame or blind or afflicted with any other blemish. Seeing that his command was ineffectual, he summoned the midwives a second time, and called them to account for the disobedience. They replied, This nation is compared unto one animal and another, and in sooth the Hebrews are like the animals. As little as the animals do, they need the offices of midwives. These two God-fearing women were rewarded in many ways for their good deeds. Not only that Pharaoh did them no harm, but they were made the ancestors of priests and Levites, the kings and princes. Jochebed became the mother of the priest Aaron and of the Levite Moses and from Miriam's union with Caleb sprang the royal house of David. The hand of God was visible in her married life. She contracted a grievous sickness, and though it was thought by all that saw her that death would certainly overtake her, she recovered, and God restored her youth and bestowed unusual beauty upon her, so that renewed happiness awaited her husband who had been deprived of the pleasures of conjugal life during her long illness. His unexpected joys were the reward of his piety and trust in God. And another recompense was accorded to Miriam. She was privileged to bring forth Bezalel, the builder of the tabernacle, who was endowed with celestial wisdom. End of chapter 4, part 1《》《Moses in Egypt》Part Two of the Legends of the Jews, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rhonda Fetterman.《The Legends of the Jews, Volume Two by Rabbi Louis Ginsburg.》The Three Counselors. In the one hundred and thirtieth year after Israel's going down to Egypt. Pharaoh dreamed that he was sitting upon his throne, and he lifted up his eyes, and he beheld an old man before him with a balance in his hand, and he saw him taking all the elders, nobles, and great men of Egypt, 
tying them together and laying them in one scale of the balance, while he put a tender kid into the other. The kid bore down the pan in which it lay until it hung lower than the other with the bound Egyptians. Pharaoh arose early in the morning and called together all his servants and his wise men to interpret his dream, and the men were greatly afraid on account of his vision. Balaam, the son of Beor, then spake and said, This means nothing but that a great evil will spring up against Egypt, for a son will be born unto Israel, who will destroy the whole of our land and all its inhabitants, and he will bring forth the Israelites from Egypt with a mighty hand. Now, therefore, O king, take counsel as to this matter, that the hope of Israel be frustrated before this evil arise against Egypt. The king said unto Balaam, What shall we do unto Israel? We have tried several devices against this people, but we could not prevail over it. Now let me hear thy opinion. At Balaam's instance the king sent for his two counsellors, Reuel the Midianite and Job the Uzite, to hear their advice. Reuel spoke, If it seemeth good to the king, let him desist from the Hebrews, and let him not stretch forth his hand against them, for the Lord chose them in the days of old, and took them as the lot of his inheritance from amongst all the nations of the earth. And who is there that hath dared stretch forth his hand against them with impunity, but that their God avenge the evil done unto them? Reuel then proceeded to enumerate some of the mighty things God had performed for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he closed his admonition with the words, Verily thy grandfather, the Pharaoh of former days, raised Joseph the son of Jacob above all the princes of Egypt, because he discerned his wisdom, for through his wisdom he rescued all the inhabitants of the land from the famine, after which he invited Jacob and his sons to come down to Egypt, that the land of Egypt and the land of Goshen be delivered from the famine through their virtues. Now, therefore, if it seem good in thine eyes, leave off from destroying the children of Israel, and if it not be thy will that thy dwell in Egypt, send them forth from here, that they may go to the land of Canaan, the land wherein their ancestors sojourned. When Pharaoh heard the words of Jethro Reuel, he was exceedingly wroth with him, and he was dismissed in disgrace from before the king and he went to Midian. The king then spoke to Job, and said, What sayest you, Job, and what is thy advice respecting the Hebrews? Job replied, Behold, all the inhabitants of the land are in thy power. Let the king do as seemeth good in his eyes. Balaam was the last to speak at the behest of the king, and he said, from all that the king may devise against the Hebrews, they will be delivered. If you thinkest to diminish them by the flaming fire, thou wilt not prevail over them. For their God delivered Abraham their father from the furnace in which the Chaldeans cast him. Perhaps you thinkest to destroy them with a sword. But their father Isaac was delivered from being slaughtered by the sword. And if thou thinkest to reduce them through hard and rigorous labor, thou wilt also not prevail. For their father Jacob served Laban in all manner of hard work, and yet he prospered. If it please the king, let him order all the male children that shall be born in Israel from this day forward to be thrown into the water. Thereby canst thou wipe out their name." for neither of any of them, nor any of their fathers, was tried in this way. The Legends of the Jews, Volume 2, by Rabbi Louis Ginsburg The Slaughter of the Innocents Balaam's advice was accepted by Pharaoh and the Egyptians. They knew that God pays measure for measure. Therefore they believed that the drowning of the men-children 
would be the safest means of exterminating the Hebrews, without incurring harm themselves, for the Lord had sworn unto Noah never again to destroy the world by water. Thus they assumed they would be exempt from punishment, wherein they were wrong, however. In the first place, though the Lord had sworn not to bring a flood upon men, there was nothing in the way of bringing men into a flood. Furthermore, the oath of God applied to the whole of mankind, not to a single nation. The end of the Egyptians was that they met their death in the billows of the Red Sea. Measure for measure, as they had drowned the men-children of the Israelites, so they were drowned. Pharaoh now took steps looking to the faithful execution of his decree. He sent his bailiffs into the houses of the Israelites to discover all newborn children, wherever they might be. To make sure that the Hebrews should not succeed in keeping the children hidden, the Egyptians hatched a devilish plan. Their women were to take their little ones to the houses of the Israelitish women that were suspected of having infants. When the Egyptian children began to cry or coo, the Hebrew children that were kept in hiding would join in, after the manner of babies, and betray their presence, whereupon the Egyptians would seize them and bear them off. Furthermore, Pharaoh commanded that the Israelitish women employ none but the Egyptian midwives, who were to secure precise information as to the time of their delivery, and were to exercise great care, and let no male child escape their vigilance alive. If there should be parents that evaded the command, and preserved a newborn boy in secret, they and all belonging to them were to be killed. Is it to be wondered at, then, that many of the Hebrews kept themselves away from their wives? Nevertheless, those who put trust in God were not forsaken by him. The women that remained united with their husbands would go out into the field when their time of delivery arrived, and give birth to their children and leave them there, while they were themselves returned home. The Lord, who had sworn unto their ancestors to multiply them, sent one of his angels to wash the babes, anoint them, stretch their limbs and swathe them. Then he would give them two smooth pebbles, from one of which they sucked milk, and from the other honey. And God caused the hair of the infants to grow down to their knees and serve them as a protecting garment. And then he ordered the earth to receive the babes, that they be sheltered therein until the time of their growing up, when it would open its mouth and vomit forth the children and they would sprout up like the herb of the field and the grass of the forest. Thereafter each would return to his family and the house of his father. When the Egyptians saw this, they went forth, every man to his field, with his yoke of oxen, and they ploughed up the earth as one ploughs it at seed time. Yet they were unable to do harm to the infants of the children of Israel that had been swallowed up and lay in the bosom of the earth. Thus the people of Israel increased and waxed exceedingly, and Pharaoh ordered his officers to go to Goshen to look for the male babes of the children of Israel. And when they discovered one, they tore him from his mother's breast by force and thrust him into the river. But no one is so valiant as to be able to foil God's purposes, though he contrive ten thousand subtle devices unto that end. The child foretold by Pharaoh's dreams and by his astrologers was brought up and kept concealed from the king's spies. It came to pass after the following manner. The Legends of the Jews, Volume 2 by Rabbi Louis Ginsburg. The Parents of Moses When Pharaoh's proclamation was issued, decreeing that the men-children of the Hebrews were to be cast into the river, Amram, who was the president of the Sanhedrin, decided that in the circumstances it was best for husbands to live altogether separate from their wives. He set the example. 
he divorced his wife, and all the men of Israel did likewise, for he occupied a place of great consideration among his people, one reason being that he belonged to the tribe of Levi, the tribe that was faithful to its God even in the land of Egypt, though the other tribes wavered in their allegiance and attempted to ally themselves with the Egyptians, going so far as to give up Abraham's sign of the covenant. To chastise the Hebrews for their impiety, God turned the love of the Egyptians for them into hatred, so that they resolved upon their destruction. Mindful of all that he and his people owed to Joseph's wise rule, Pharaoh refused at first to entertain the malicious plans proposed by the Egyptians against the Hebrews. He spoke to his people, You fools, we are indebted to these Hebrews for whatever we enjoy, and you desire now to rise up against them? But the Egyptians could not be turned aside from their purpose of ruining Israel. They deposed their king and incarcerated him for three months until he declared himself ready to execute with determination what they had resolved upon and he sought to bring about the ruin of the children of Israel by every conceivable means. Such was the retribution they had drawn down upon themselves by their own acts. As for Amram, not only did he belong to the tribe of Levi, distinguished for its piety, but by reason of his extraordinary piety, he was prominent even among the pious of the tribe, he was one of the four who were immaculate, untainted by sin, over whom death would have had no power, had mortality not been decreed against every single human being on account of the fall of the first man and woman. The other three that led the same sinless life was Benjamin, Jesse, the father of David, and Chileab, the son of David. If the Shekinah was drawn close again to the dwelling place of mortals, it was due to Amram's piety. Originally the real residence of the Shekinah was among men. But when Adam committed his sin, she withdrew to heaven, at first to the lowest of the seven heavens. Thence she was banished by Cain's crime, and she retired to the second heaven. The sins of the generation of Enoch removed her still farther off of men. She took up her abode in the third heaven then successively, in the fourth, on account of the malefactors in the generation of the deluge, in the fifth, during the building of the Tower of Babel and the confusion of the tongues, in the sixth, by reason of the wicked Egyptians at the time of Abraham, and finally, in the seventh, in consequence of the abominations of the inhabitants of Sodom. Six righteous men, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Levi, Kohath, and Amram, drew the Shekinah back, one by one, from the seventh to the first heaven, and through the seventh righteous man, Moses. She was made to descend to the earth and abide among men as aforetime. Amram's sagacity kept pace with his piety and his learning. The Egyptians succeeded in enslaving the Hebrews by seductive promises. At first they gave them a shekel for every brick they made, tempting them to superhuman efforts by the prospect of earning much money. Later, when the Egyptians forced them to work without wages, they insisted upon having as many bricks as the Hebrews had made when their labor was paid for, but they could demand only a single brick daily from Amram for he had been the only one whom they had not led astray by their artifice. He had been satisfied with a single shekel daily, and had therefore made only a single brick daily, which they had to accept afterward as the measure of his day's work. As his life partner, Amram chose his aunt, Yochebed, who was born the same day with him. She was the daughter of Levi, and she owed her name, Divine Splendor, to the celestial light that radiated from her countenance. She was worthy of being her husband's helpmeet, for she was one of the midwives that had imperiled their own lives to rescue the little Hebrew babes. 
Indeed, if God had not allowed a miracle to happen, she and her daughter Miriam would have been killed by Pharaoh for having resisted his orders and saved the Hebrew children alive. When the king sent his hangman for the two women, God caused them to become invisible, and the bailiffs had to return without accomplishing their errand. The first child of the union between Amram and Jochebed, his wife, who was one hundred and twenty-six years old at the time of her marriage, was a girl, and the mother called her Miriam. Bitterness, for it was at the time of her birth that the Egyptians began to envenom the lives of the Hebrews. The second child was a boy, called Aaron, which means, Woe to this pregnancy, because Pharaoh's instructions to the midwives to kill the male children of the Hebrews was proclaimed during the months before Aaron's birth. End of chapter 4, part 2《Moses in Egypt》Part Three of *The Legends of the Jews*, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rhonda Fetterman. *The Legends of the Jews*, Volume Two, by Rabbi Louis Ginsburg. The Birth of Moses. When Amram separated from his wife on account of the edict published against the male children of the Hebrews, and his example was followed by all the Israelites, his daughter Miriam said to him, Father, thy decree is worse than Pharaoh's decree. The Egyptians aim to destroy only the male children, but thou includest the girls as well. Pharaoh deprives his victims of life in this world, but thou preventest children from being born, and thus deprivest them of the future life too. He resolves destruction, but who knows whether the intention of the wicked can persist? Thou art a righteous man, and the enactments of the righteous are executed by God. Hence thy decree will be upheld. Amram recognized the justice of her plea and he repaired to the Sanhedrin and put the matter before this body. The members of the court spoke and said, It was thou that didst separate husbands and wives, and from thee should go forth the permission for remarriage. Amram then made the proposition that each of the members of the Sanhedrin return to his wife and wed her clandestinely. But his colleagues repudiated the plan, saying, and who will make it known unto the whole of Israel? Accordingly, Amram stood publicly under the wedding canopy with his divorced wife, Jochebed, while Aaron and Miriam danced about it, and the angels proclaimed, Let the mother of children be joyful. His remarriage was solemnized with great ceremony, to the end that the men that bade followed his example in divorcing their wives might imitate him now in taking them again unto themselves. And so it happened. Old as Jochebed was, she regained her youth. Her skin became soft, the wrinkles in her face disappeared, the warm tints of maiden beauty returned, and in a short time she became pregnant. Amram was very uneasy about his wife's being with child. He knew not what to do. He turned to God in prayer, and entreated him to have compassion upon those who had in no wise transgressed the laws of his worship, and afford them deliverance from the misery they endured, while he rendered abortive the hope of their enemies, who yearned for the destruction of their nation. God had mercy on him, and he stood by him in his sleep, and exhorted him not to despair of his future favors. He said further, that he did not forget their piety, and he would always reward them for it, as he had granted his favor in other days unto their forefathers. Know, therefore, the Lord continued to speak, that I shall provide for you altogether what is for your good, and for thee in particular 
that which shall make thee celebrated, for the child out of dread, of whose nativity the Egyptians have doomed the Israelite children to destruction, shall be this child of thine, and be shall remain concealed from those who watch to destroy him. And when he has been bred up, in a miraculous way, he shall deliver the Hebrew nation from the distress they are under by reason of the Egyptians. His memory shall be celebrated while the world lasts, and not only among the Hebrews, but among strangers also. And all this shall be the effect of my favor toward thee and thy posterity. Also his brother shall be such that he shall obtain my priesthood for himself, and for his posterity after him, unto the end of the world. After he had been informed of these things by the vision, Amram awoke and told all unto his wife Jehobed. His daughter Miriam likewise had a prophetic dream, and she related it unto her parents, saying, In this night I saw a man clothed in fine linen. Tell thy father and thy mother, he said, that he who shall be born unto them shall be cast into the waters, and through him the waters shall become dry, and wonders and miracles shall be performed through him, and he shall save my people Israel, and be their leader for ever. During her pregnancy, Jochebed observed that the child in her womb was destined for great things. All the time she suffered no pain, and also she suffered none in giving birth to her son, for pious women are not included in the curse pronounced upon Eve, decreeing sorrow in conception and in childbearing. At the moment of the child's appearance, the whole house was filled with radiance equal to the splendor of the sun and the moon. A still greater miracle followed. The infant was not yet a day old when he began to walk and speak with his parents, and as though he were an adult, he refused to drink milk from his mother's breast. Jochebed gave birth to the child six months after conception. The Egyptian bailiffs, who kept strict watch over all pregnant women in order to be on the spot in time to carry off the newborn boys, had not expected her delivery for three months more. These three months the parents succeeded in keeping the babe concealed, though every Israelitish house was guarded by two Egyptian women, one stationed within and one without. At the end of this time they determined to expose the child, for Amram was afraid that both he and his son would be devoted to death if the secret leaked out, and he thought it would be better to entrust the child's fate to divine providence. He was convinced that God would protect the boy and fulfill his word in truth. The Legends of the Jews, Volume 2, by Rabbi Louis Ginsburg Moses Rescued from the Water Jochebed accordingly took an ark fashioned of bulrushes, daubed it with pitch on the outside, and lined it with clay within. The reason she used bulrushes was because they float on the surface of the water and she put pitch only on the outside to protect the child as much as possible against the annoyance of a disagreeable odor. Over the child as it lay in the ark, she spread a tiny canopy to shade the babe with the words, Perhaps I shall not live to see him under the marriage canopy. And then she abandoned the ark on the shores of the Red Sea. Yet it was not left unguarded. Her daughter Miriam stayed near by, to discover whether a prophecy she had uttered would be fulfilled. Before the child's birth, his sister had foretold that her mother would bring forth a son that should redeem Israel. When he was born, and the house was filled with a brilliant light, Amram kissed her on her head. But when he was forced into the expedient of exposing the child, he beat her on her head, saying, my daughter, what hath become of thy prophecy? Therefore Miriam stayed and strolled along the shore to observe what would be the fate of the babe and what would come of her prophecy concerning him. The day the child was exposed was the twenty-first of the month of Nisan, 
the same on which the children of Israel later, under the leadership of Moses, sang the song of praise and gratitude to God for the redemption from the waters of the sea. The angels appeared before God and spoke, O Lord of the world, shall he that is appointed to sing a song of praise unto thee on this day of Nisan, to thank thee for rescuing him and his people from the sea, shall he find his death in the sea to-day? The Lord replied, Ye know well that I see all things. The contriving of man can do naught to change what hath been resolved in my counsel. Those do not attain their end who use cunning and malice to secure their own safety, and endeavor to bring ruin upon their fellow men. But he who trusts me in his peril will be conveyed from profoundest distress to unlooked-for happiness. Thus my omnipotence will reveal itself in the fortunes of this babe. At the time of the child's abandonment, God sent scorching heat to plague the Egyptians, and they all suffered with leprosy and smarting boils. Thermitus, the daughter of Pharaoh, sought relief from the burning pain in a bath in the waters of the Nile, but physical discomfort was not her only reason for leaving her father's palace. She was determined to cleanse herself as well of the impurity of the idol worship that prevailed there. When she saw the little ark floating among the flags on the surface of the water, she supposed it to contain one of the little children exposed at her father's orders, and she commanded her handmaids to fetch it. But they protested, saying, O oh, our mistress, it happens sometimes that a decree issued by a king is unheeded, yet it is observed at least by his children and the members of his household. And dost thou desire to transgress thy father's edict? Forthwith the angel Gabriel appeared, seized all the maids except one, whom he permitted the princess to retain for her service, and buried them in the bowels of the earth. Pharaoh's daughter now proceeded to do her own will. She stretched forth her arm, and although the ark was swimming at a distance of sixty ells, she succeeded in grasping it, because her arm was lengthened miraculously. No sooner had she touched it, then the leprosy afflicting her departed from her. Her sudden restoration led her to examine the contents of the ark, and when she opened it, her amazement was great. She beheld an exquisitely beautiful boy, for God had fashioned the Hebrew babe's body with peculiar care, and beside it she perceived the Shekinah. Noticing that the boy bore the sign of the Abrahamic covenant, she knew that he was one of the Hebrew children, and mindful of her father's decree concerning the male children of the Israelites, she was about to abandon the babe to his fate. At that moment the angel Gabriel came and gave the child a vigorous blow, and he began to cry aloud, with a voice like a young man's. His vehement weeping and the weeping of Aaron, who was lying beside him, touched the princess and in her pity she resolved to save him. She ordered an Egyptian woman to be brought to nurse the child, but the little one refused to take milk from her breast, as he refused to take it from one after the other of the Egyptian women fetched thither. Thus it had been ordained by God that none of them might boast later on and say, I suckled him that holds converse now with the Shekinah, nor was it the mouth destined to speak with God to draw nourishment from the unclean body of an Egyptian woman. Now Miriam stepped into the presence of Thermitus, as though she had been standing there by chance to look at the child, and she spoke to the princess, saying, It is vain for thee, O queen, to call for nurses that are in no wise of kin to the child. But if thou wilt order a woman of the Hebrews to be brought, he may accept her breast, seeing that she is of his own nation. Thermutus therefore bade Miriam fetch a Hebrew woman, and with winged steps, speeding like a vigorous youth, she hastened and brought back her own mother, the child's mother, for she knew that none present was acquainted with her. The babe, unresisting, took his mother's breast and clutched it tightly. 
the princess committed the child to Jochebed's care, saying these words, which contained an unconscious divination. Here is what is thine. Nurse the boy henceforth, and I will give thee two silver pieces as thy wages. The return of her son, safe and sound, after she had exposed him, was Jochebed's reward from God for her services as one of the midwives that had bidden defiance to Pharaoh's command and saved the Hebrew children alive. By exposing their son to danger, Amram and Jochebed had effected the withdrawal of Pharaoh's command in joining the extermination of the Hebrew men children. The day Moses was set adrift in the little ark, the astrologers had come to Pharaoh and told him the glad tidings, that the danger threatening the Egyptians on account of one boy, whose doom lay in the water, had now been averted. Thereupon Pharaoh cried a halt to the drowning of the boys of his empire. The astrologers had seen something, but they knew not what, and they had announced a message, the import of which they did not comprehend. Water was indeed the doom of Moses, but that did not mean that he would perish in the water of the Nile. It had reference to the waters of Mirabah, the waters of strife, and how they would cause his death in the desert, before he had completed his task of leading the people into the promised land. Pharaoh, misled by the obscure vision of his astrologers, thought that the future Redeemer of Israel was to lose his life by drowning, and to make sure that the boy whose appearance was foretold by the astrologers might not escape his fate, he had ordered all boys, even the children of the Egyptians, born during a period of nine months, to be cast into the water. On account of the merits of Moses, the six hundred thousand men children of the Hebrews begotten in the same night with him, and thrown into the water on the same day, were rescued miraculously together with him, and it was therefore not an idle boast, if he said later, The people that went forth out of the water on account of my merits are six hundred thousand men. The Legends of the Jews, Volume 2, by Rabbi Louis Ginsburg The Infancy of Moses for two years the child rescued by Pharaoh's daughter stayed with his parents and kindred. They gave him various names. His father called him Heber, because it was for this child's sake that he had been reunited with his wife. His mother's name for him was Jacuthiel, because, she said, I set my hope upon God and he gave him back to me. To his sister Miriam he was Jared, because he had descended to the stream to ascertain his fate. His brother Aaron called him Abi Zanoah, because his father, who had cast off his mother, had taken her back for the sake of the child to be born. His grandfather, Kohath, knew him as Abi Gidor, because the Heavenly Father had built up the breach in Israel when he rescued him, and thus restrained the Egyptians from throwing the Hebrew men children into the water. His nurse called him Abi Soko, because he had been kept concealed in a tent for three months, escaping the pursuit of the Egyptians. And Israel called him Shemaiah ben Nathanel, because in his day God would hear the sighs of the people, and deliver them from their oppressors, and through him he would give them his own law. His kindred and all Israel knew that the child was destined for great things, for he was barely four months old when he began to prophesy, saying, In days to come I shall receive the Torah from the flaming torch. When Jochebed took the child to the palace at the end of two years, Pharaoh's daughter called him Moses, because she had drawn him out of the water, and because he would draw the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt in a day to come. And this was the only name whereby God called the son of Amram, the name conferred upon him by Pharaoh's daughter. He said to the princess, Moses was not thy child, yet thou didst treat him as such. For this I will call thee my daughter, though thou art not my daughter. 
and therefore the princess, the daughter of Pharaoh, bears the name Bithia, the daughter of God. She married Caleb later on, and he was a suitable husband for her. As she stood up against her father's wicked counsels, so Caleb stood up against the counsel of his fellow messengers sent to spy out the land of Canaan. For rescuing Moses and for her other pious deeds, she was permitted to enter paradise alive. That Moses might receive the treatment at court usually accorded to a prince, Bithia pretended that she was with child for some time before she had him fetched away from his parents' house. His royal foster-mother caressed and kissed him constantly, and on account of his extraordinary beauty, she would not permit him ever to quit the palace. Whoever set eyes on him could not leave off from looking at him, wherefore Bithia feared to allow him out of her sight. Moses's understanding was far beyond his years. His instructors observed that he disclosed keener comprehension than is usual at his age. All his actions in his infancy promised greater ones after he should come to man's estate, and when he was but three years old, God granted him remarkable size. As for his beauty, it was so attractive that frequently those meeting him as he was carried along on the road were obliged to turn and stare at him. They would leave what they were about, and stand still a great while, looking after him, for the loveliness of the child was so wondrous that it held the gaze of the spectator. The daughter of Pharaoh, perceiving Moses to be an extraordinary lad, adopted him as her son, for she had no child of her own. She informed her father of her intention concerning him in these words, I have brought up a child who is divine in form and of an excellent mind, and as I received him through the bounty of the river in a wonderful way, I have thought it proper to adopt him as my son and as the heir of thy kingdom. And when she had spoken thus, she put the infant between her father's hands, and he took him and hugged him close to his breast. End of chapter 4, part 3《Four Moses in Egypt》Part Four of the Legends of the Jews, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rhonda Fetterman. *** The Legends of the Jews, Volume Two, by Rabbi Louis Ginsburg. Moses rescued by Gabriel. When Moses was in his third year, Pharaoh was dining one day, with the queen Alpharanit at his right hand, his daughter Bithia, with the infant Moses upon her lap at his left, and Balaam, the son of Beor, together with his two sons and all the princes of the realm, sitting at table in the king's presence. It happened that the infant took the crown from off the king's head and placed it on his own. When the king and the princes saw this, they were terrified, and each one in turn expressed his astonishment. The king said unto the princes, What speak you, and what say you, O ye princes, on this matter? And what is to be done to this Hebrew boy on account of this act? Balaam spoke, saying, Remember now, O my lord and king, the dream which thou didst dream many days ago and how thy servant interpreted it unto thee. Now this is a child of the Hebrews in whom is the Spirit of God. Let not my lord the king imagine in his heart that being a child he did the thing without knowledge. For he is a Hebrew boy, and wisdom and understanding are with him. Although he is yet a child, and with wisdom he has done this, and chosen unto himself the kingdom of Egypt. For this is the manner of all the Hebrews, to deceive kings and their magnates, to do all things cunningly in order to make the kings of the earth and their men to stumble. Surely thou knowest that Abraham their father acted thus. Who made the armies of Nimrod king of Babel, and of Abimelech 
king of Gerar, to stumble. And he possessed himself of the land of the children of Heth, and the whole realm of Canaan. Their father Abraham went down into Egypt, and said of Sarah his wife, She is my sister, in order to make Egypt and its king to stumble. His son Isaac did likewise when he went to Gerar, and he dwelt there, and his strength prevailed over the army of Abimelech, and he intended to make the king of the Philistines to stumble, by saying that Rebekah his wife was his sister. Jacob also dealt treacherously with his brother, and took his birthright and his blessings from him. Then he went to Paddan Aram, to Laban, his mother's brother, and he obtained his daughters from him cunningly, and also his cattle and all his belongings, and he fled away and returned to the land of Canaan, to his father. His sons sold their brother Joseph, and he went down into Egypt and became a slave, and he was put into prison for twelve years until the former Pharaoh delivered him from the prison, and magnified him above the princes of Egypt on account of his interpreting the king's dreams. When God caused a famine to descend upon the whole world, Joseph sent for his father, and he brought him down into Egypt, his father, his brethren, and all his father's household, and he supplied them with food without pay or reward, while he acquired Egypt, and made slaves of all its inhabitants. Now therefore, my lord king, behold, this child has risen up in their stead in Egypt, to do according to their deeds, and make sport of every man, be he king, prince, or judge. If it please the king, let us now spill his blood upon the ground, lest he grow up and snatch the government from thine hand, and the hope of Egypt be cut off after he reigns. Let us moreover call for all the judges and the wise men of Egypt, that we may know whether the judgment of death be due to this child, as I have said, and then we will slay him. Pharaoh sent and called for all the wise men of Egypt, and they came, and the angel Gabriel was disguised as one of them. When they were asked their opinion in the matter, Gabriel spoke up and said, If it please the king, let him place an onyx stone before the child, and a coal of fire, and if he stretches out his hand and grasps the onyx stone, then shall we know that the child hath done with wisdom all that he hath done, and we will slay him. But if he stretches out his hand, and grasps the coal of fire, then shall we know that it was not with consciousness that he did the thing, and he shall live. The counsel seemed good in the eyes of the king, and when they had placed the stone and the coal before the child, Moses stretched forth his hand towards the onyx stone, and attempted to seize it. But the angel Gabriel guided his hand away from it, and placed it upon the live coal, and the coal burnt the child's hand, and he lifted it up and touched it to his mouth, and burnt part of his lips and part of his tongue, and for all his life he became slow of speech and of a slow tongue. Seeing this, the king and the princes knew that Moses had not acted with knowledge in taking the crown from off the king's head, and they refrained from slaying him. God himself, who protected Moses, turned the king's mind to grace, and his foster mother snatched him away, and she had him educated with great care, so that the Hebrews depended upon him, and cherished the hope that great things would be done by him. But the Egyptians were suspicious of what would follow from such an education as his. At great cost, teachers were invited to come to Egypt from neighboring lands to educate the child Moses. Some came of their own accord to instruct him in the sciences and the liberal arts. By reason of his admirable endowments of mind, he soon excelled his teachers in knowledge. His learning seemed a process of mere recollecting, and when there was a difference of opinion among scholars— he selected the correct one instinctively, for his mind refused to store up anything that was false. 
but he deserves more praise for his unusual strength of will than for his natural capacity, for he succeeded in transforming an originally evil disposition into a noble, exalted character, a change that was farther aided by his resolution, as he himself acknowledged later. After the wonderful exodus of the Israelites from Egypt, a king of Arabia sent an artist to Moses to paint his portrait, that he might always have the likeness of the divine man before him. The painter returned with his handiwork, and the king assembled his wise men, those in particular who were conversant with the science of physiognomy. He displayed the portrait before them, and invited their judgment upon it. The unanimous opinion was that it represented a man covetous, haughty, sensual, in short, disfigured by all possible ugly traits. The king was indignant that they should pretend to be masters in physiognomy, seeing that they declared the picture of Moses, the holy, divine man, to be the picture of a villain. They defended themselves by accusing the painter in turn of not having produced a true portrait of Moses, else they would not have fallen into the erroneous judgment they had expressed. But the artist insisted that his work resembled the original closely. Unable to decide who was right, the Arabian king went to see Moses, and he could not but admit that the portrait painted for him was a masterpiece. Moses, as he beheld him in the flesh, was the Moses upon the canvas. There could be no doubt but that the highly extolled knowledge of his physiognomy experts was empty twaddle. He told Moses what had happened, and what he thought of it. He replied, Thy artist and thy experts alike are masters, each in his line. If my fine qualities were a product of nature, I were no better than a log of wood, which remains for ever as nature produced it at the first. Unashamed I make the confession to thee, that by nature I possessed all the reprehensible traits thy wise men read in my picture and ascribed to me, perhaps to a greater degree even than they think. But I mastered my evil impulses with my strong will, and the character I acquired through severe discipline has become the opposite of the disposition with which I was born. Through this change, wrought in me by my own efforts, I have earned honor and commendation upon earth, as well as in heaven. The Legends of the Jews, Volume 2, by Rabbi Louis Ginsburg The Youth of Moses One day, it was after he was grown up and had passed beyond the years of childhood, Moses went to the land of Goshen, in which lived the children of Israel. There he saw the burdens under which his people were groaning, and he inquired why the heavy service had been put upon them. The Israelites told him all that had befallen, told him of the cruel edict Pharaoh had issued shortly before his birth, and told him of the wicked counsels given by Balaam against themselves as well as his person when he was but a little boy and had set Pharaoh's crown upon his head. The wrath of Moses was kindled against the spiteful adviser, and he tried to think out means of rendering him harmless. But Balaam, getting wind of his ill feeling, fled from Egypt with his two sons, and betook himself to the courts of Kikanos, king of Ethiopia. The sight of his enslaved people touched Moses unto tears, and he spoke, saying, Woe unto me for your anguish! Rather would I die than see you suffer so grievously. He did not disdain to help his unfortunate brethren at their heavy tasks, as much as lay in his power. He dismissed all thought of his high station at court, shouldered a share of the burdens put upon the Israelites, and toiled in their place. The result was that he not only gave relief to the heavily laden workmen, but he also gained the favor of Pharaoh, who believed that Moses was taking part in the labor in order to promote the execution of the royal order. And God said unto Moses, 
thou didst relinquish all thy other occupations, and didst join thyself unto the children of Israel, whom thou dost treat as brethren. Therefore will I, too, put aside now all heavenly and earthly affairs, and hold converse with thee. Moses continued to do all he could to alleviate the suffering of his brethren to the best of his ability. He addressed encouraging words to them, saying, My dear brethren, bear your lot with fortitude, do not lose courage, and let not your spirit grow weary with the weariness of your body. Better times will come, when tribulation shall be changed into joy. Clouds are followed by sunshine, storms by calm. All things in the world tend towards their opposites, and nothing is more inconstant than the fortunes of man. The royal favor, which the king accorded him in ever-increasing measure, he made use of to lighten the burden laid upon the children of Israel. One day he came into the presence of Pharaoh and said, O oh, my Lord, I have a request to make of thee, and my hope is that thou wilt not deny it. Speak, replied the king. It is an admitted fact, said Moses, that if a slave is not afforded rest at least one day in the week, he will die of overexertion. Thy Hebrew slaves will surely perish, unless thou accordest them a day of cessation from work. Pharaoh fulfilled the petition preferred by Moses, and the king's edict was published in the whole of Egypt and in Goshen as follows. To the sons of Israel, thus saith the king, Do your work and perform your service for six days, but on the seventh day you shall rest, and on it ye shall do no labor. Thus shall ye do unto all times, according to the command of the king and the command of Moses, the son of Bithia. And the day appointed by Moses as the day of rest was Saturday, later given by God to the Israelites as the Sabbath day. While Moses abode in Goshen, an incident of great importance occurred. To superintend the service of the children of Israel, an officer from among them was set over every ten and ten such officers were under the surveillance of an Egyptian taskmaster. One of these Hebrew officers, Dathan by name, had a wife, Shelomith, the daughter of Dibri, of the tribe of Dan, who was of extraordinary beauty, but inclined to be very loquacious. Whenever the Egyptian taskmaster set over her husband came to their house on business connected with his office, she would approach him pleasantly and enter into conversation with him. The beautiful Israelitish woman enkindled a mad passion in his breast, and he sought and found a cunning way of satisfying his lustful desire. One day he appeared at break of dawn at the house of Dathan, roused him from his sleep, and ordered him to hurry his detachment of men to their work. The husband scarcely out of sight, he executed the villainy he had planned, and dishonored the woman, and the fruit of this illicit relation was the blasphemer of the name whom Moses ordered to execution on the march through the desert. At the moment when the Egyptian slipped out of Shelomith's chamber, Dathan returned home. Vexed that his crime had come to the knowledge of the injured husband, the taskmaster goaded him on to work with excessive vigor, and dealt him blow after blow with the intention to kill him. Young Moses happened to visit the place at which the much abused and tortured Hebrew was at work. Dathan hastened toward him, and complained of all the wrong and suffering the Egyptian had inflicted upon him. Full of wrath, Moses, whom the Holy Spirit had acquainted with the injury done the Hebrew officer by the Egyptian taskmaster, cried out to the latter, saying, Not enough that thou hast dishonored this man's wife, thou aimest to kill him too? And turning to God, he spoke further, What will become of thy promise to Abraham, that his posterity shall be as numerous as the stars, if his children are given over to death? And what will become of the revelation on Sinai, 
if the children of Israel are exterminated. Moses wanted to see if someone would step forward, and impelled by zeal for the cause of God and for God's law, would declare himself ready to avenge the outrage. He waited in vain. Then he determined to act himself. Naturally enough, he hesitated to take the life of a human being. He did not know whether the evildoer might not be brought to repentance, and then lead a life of pious endeavor. He also considered that there would perhaps be some among the descendants to spring from the Egyptian, for whose sake their wicked ancestor might rightfully lay claim to clemency. The Holy Spirit allayed all his doubts. He was made to see that not the slightest hope existed that good would come either from the malefactor himself or from any of his offspring. Then Moses was willing to requite him for his evil deeds. Nevertheless, he first consulted the angels to hear what they had to say, and they agreed that the Egyptian deserved death, and Moses acted according to their opinion. Neither physical strength nor a weapon was needed to carry out his purpose. He merely pronounced the name of God, and the Egyptian was a corpse. To the bystanders, the Israelites, Moses said, The Lord compared you to the sand of the seashore, and as the sand moves noiselessly from place to place, so I pray you to keep the knowledge of what hath happened a secret within yourselves. Let nothing be heard concerning it. The wish expressed by Moses was not honored. The slaying of the Egyptian remained no secret, and those who betrayed it were Israelites, Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Palu, of the tribe of Reuben, notorious for their effrontery and contentiousness. The day after the thing with the Egyptian happened, the two brothers began of malice of forethought to scuffle with each other, only in order to draw Moses into the quarrel and create an occasion for his betrayal. The plan succeeded admirably. Seeing Dathan raise his hands against Abiram to deal him a blow, Moses exclaimed, O oh, thou art a villain to lift up thy hand against an Israelite, even if he is no better than thou. Dathan replied, Young man, who hath made thee to be a judge over us? Thou that hast not yet attained to years of maturity, we know very well that thou art the son of Jochebed, though people call thee the son of Princess Bithia, and if thou should attempt to play the part of our master and judge, we will publish abroad the thing thou didst unto the Egyptian. Or, peradventure, thou harborest the intention to slay us as thou didst slay him, by pronouncing the name of God? Not satisfied with these taunts, the noble pair of brothers betook themselves to Pharaoh, and spoke before him. Moses dishonoreth thy royal mantle and thy crown, to which Pharaoh returned, saying, Much good may it do him but they pursued the subject. He helped thine enemies, Pharaoh, they continued, whereupon he replied, as before, Much good may it do him. Still they went on, He is not the son of thy daughter. These last words did not fail of making an impression upon Pharaoh. A royal command was issued for the arrest of Moses, and he was condemned to death by the sword. The angels came to God and said, Moses, the familiar of thine house is held under restraint. And God replied, I will espouse his cause. But, the angels urged, his verdict of death has been pronounced. Yes, they are leading him to execution. And again God made reply as before, I will espouse his cause. Moses mounted the scaffold, and a sword, sharp beyond compare, was set upon his neck ten times, but it always slipped away, because his neck was as hard as ivory. And a still greater miracle came to pass. 
God sent down the angel Michael, in the guise of a hangman, and the human hangman charged by Pharaoh with the execution was changed into the form of Moses. This spurious Moses the angel killed with the very sword with which the executioner had proposed to slay the intended victim. Meantime, Moses took to flight. Pharaoh ordered his pursuit, but it was in vain. The king's troops were partly stricken with blindness, partly with dumbness. The dumb could give no information about the abiding place of Moses, and the blind, though they knew where it was, could not get to it. End of chapter 4, part 4《Chapter Four: Moses in Egypt, Part Five of the Legends of the Jews, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rhonda Fetterman. The Legends of the Jews, Volume Two, by Rabbi Louis Ginsburg. The Flight. An angel of God took Moses to a spot removed forty days' journey from Egypt, so far off that all fear was banished from his mind. Indeed, his anxiety had never been for his own person, but only on account of the future of Israel. The subjugation of his people had always been an unsolved enigma to him. Why should Israel, he would ask himself, suffer more than all the other nations. But when his personal straits initiated him in the tail-bearing and backbiting that prevailed among the Israelites, then he asked himself, Does this people deserve to be redeemed? The religious conditions among the children of Israel were of such kind at the time as not to permit them to hope for divine assistance. They refused to give ear to Aaron and the five sons of Zerah, who worked among them as prophets, and admonished them unto the fear of God. It was on account of their impiety that the heavy hand of Pharaoh rested upon them more and more oppressively, until God had mercy upon them, and sent Moses to deliver them from the slavery of Egypt. When he succeeded in effecting his escape from the hands of the hangman, Moses had no idea that a royal throne awaited him. It was nevertheless so. A war broke out at this time between Ethiopia and the nations of the East that had been subject to it until then. Kikanos, the king, advanced against the enemy with a great army. He left Balaam and Balaam's two sons, Jannes and Jambres behind, to keep guard over his capital and take charge of the people remaining at home. The absence of the king gave Balaam the opportunity of winning his subjects over to his side, and he was put upon the throne, and his two sons were set over the armies as generals. To cut Kikanos off from his capital, Balaam and his sons invested the city, so that none could enter it against their will. On two sides they made the walls higher, on the third they dug a network of canals, into which they conducted the waters of the river girding the whole land of Ethiopia, and on the fourth side their magic arts collected a large swarm of snakes and scorpions. Thus none could depart, and none could enter. Meantime Kikanos succeeded in subjugating the rebellious nations. When he returned at the head of his victorious army, and espied the high city wall from afar, he and his men said, The inhabitants of the city, seeing that the war detained us abroad for a long time, have raised the walls and fortified them, that the kings of Canaan may not be able to enter. On approaching the city gates, which were barred, they cried out to the guards to open them, but by Balaam's instructions they were not permitted to pass through. A skirmish ensued in which Kikanos lost one hundred and thirty men. On the morrow the combat was continued. 
the king with his troops being stationed on the thither bank of the river. This day he lost his thirty riders, who, mounted on their steeds, had attempted to swim the stream. Then the king ordered rafts to be constructed for the transporting of his men. When the vessels reached the canals, they were submerged, and the waters, swirling round and round as though driven by mill wheels, swept away two hundred men, twenty from each raft. On the third day they set about assaulting the city from the side on which the snakes and scorpions swarmed, but they failed to reach it, and the reptiles killed one hundred and seventy men. The king desisted from attacking the city, but for the space of nine years he surrounded it, so that none could come out or go in. While the siege was in progress, Moses appeared in the king's camp on his flight before Pharaoh, and at once found favor with Kikanos and his whole army. He exercised an attraction upon all that saw him, for he was slender like a palm tree, his countenance shone as the morning sun, and his strength was equal to a lion's. So deep was the king's affection for him that he appointed him to be commander-in-chief of his forces. At the end of the nine years Kikanos fell prey to a mortal disease, and he died on the seventh day of his illness. His servants embalmed him, buried him opposite to the city gate towards the land of Egypt, and over his grave they erected a magnificent structure, strong and high, upon the walls whereof they engraved all the mighty deeds and battles of the dead king. Now, after the death of Kikanos, his men were greatly grieved on account of the war. One said unto the other, Counsel us, what shall we do at this time? We have been abiding in the wilderness, away from our homes, for nine years. If we fight against the city, many of us will fall dead, and if we remain here besieging it, we shall also die. For now all the princes of Aram and the children of the east will hear that our king is dead, and they will attack us suddenly, and they will fight with us until not a remnant will be left. Now therefore let us go and set a king over us, and we will remain here besieging the city until it surrenders unto us. The Legends of the Jews, Volume 2, by Rabbi Louis Ginsburg The King of Ethiopia They could find none except Moses fit to be their king. They hastened and stripped off each man his upper garment, and cast them all in a heap upon the ground, making a high place, on top of which they set Moses. Then they blew with trumpets and called out before him, Long live the king! Long live the king! And all the people and the nobles swore unto him to give him Adoniah for wife, the Ethiopian queen, the widow of Kikanos. And they made Moses king over them on that day. They also issued a proclamation, commanding every man to give Moses of what he possessed, and upon the high place they spread a sheet, wherein each one cast something, this one a gold nose-ring, that one a coin, and onyx stones, bdellium, pearls, gold, and silver, in great abundance. Moses was twenty-seven years old when he became king over Ethiopia, and he reigned for forty years. On the seventh day of his reign, all the people assembled and came before him, to ask his counsel as to what was to be done to the city they were besieging. The king answered them, and said, If you will hearken to my words, the city will be delivered into our hands. Proclaim with a loud voice throughout the whole camp unto all the people, saying, Thus saith the king, Go to the forest and fetch hither of the young of the stork, each man one fledgling in his hand. And if there be any man that transgresseth the word of the king, 
not to bring a bird, he shall die, and the king shall take all belonging to him. And when you have brought them, they shall be in your keeping. You shall rear them until they grow up, and you shall teach them to fly as the hawk flieth. All the people did according to the word of Moses, and after the young storks had grown to full size, he ordered them to be starved for three days. On the third day the king said unto them, Let every man put on his armor, and gird his sword upon him. Each one shall mount his horse, and each shall set his stork upon his hand, and we will rise up and fight against the city, opposite to the place of the serpents. When they came to the appointed spot, the king said to them, Let each man send forth his young stork, to descend upon the serpents. Thus they did, and the birds swooped down and devoured all the reptiles and destroyed them. After the serpents were removed in this way, the men fought against the city, subdued it, and killed all its inhabitants. But of the people besieging it, there died not one. When Balaam saw that the city had fallen into the hands of the besiegers, he exercised his magic arts, which enabled him to fly through the air, and he carried with him his two sons, Janes and Jambres, and his eight brothers, and they all took refuge in Egypt. Seeing that they had been saved by the king, and the city had been taken by his good counsel, the people became more than ever attached to him. They set the royal crown upon his head, and gave him Adoniah, the widow of Kikanos, to wife. But Moses feared the stern God of his fathers, and he went not in unto Adoniah, nor did he turn his eyes toward her, for he remembered how Abraham had made his servant Eliezer swear, saying unto him, Thou shalt not take a wife for my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell. He also remembered what Isaac did when Jacob fled before his brother Esau, how he commanded his son, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan, nor ally thyself by marriage with any of the children of Ham. For the Lord our God gave Ham, the son of Noah, and all his seed as slaves to the children of Shem and Japheth for ever. At that time Aram and the children of the east heard that Kikanos, the king of Ethiopia, had died, and they rose up against the Ethiopians. But Moses went forth with a mighty army to fight against the rebellious nations, and he subdued them, first the children of the east, and then Aram. Moses continued to prosper in his kingdom. He conducted the government in justice, righteousness, and integrity, and his people loved and feared him. In the fortieth year of his reign, while he was sitting upon his throne one day, surrounded by all the nobles, Adoniah the queen, who was seated before him, rose up and spake, What is this thing which you, the people of Ethiopia, have done these many days? Surely you know that during the forty years this man hath reigned over you, he hath not approached me, nor hath he worshipped the gods of Ethiopia. Now therefore let this man reign over you no more, for he is not of our flesh. Behold, Monarchos my son is grown up, let him reign over you. It is better for you to serve the son of your lord than a stranger, a slave of the king of Egypt. The whole day the people and the nobles contended with one another, whether to pay heed to the words of the queen. The officers of the army remained faithful to Moses, but the people of the cities were in favor of crowning the son of their former lord as king. The following morning they rose up and made Monarchos, the son of Kikanos, king over them, but they were afraid to stretch forth their hand against Moses for the Lord was with him. They also remembered the oath they had sworn unto Moses, and therefore they did him no harm. 
Moreover, they gave many presents to him, and dismissed him with great honor. When Moses left Ethiopia in the sixty-seventh year of his age, it was the time appointed by God in the days of old to bring Israel forth from the affliction of the children of Ham. But fearing to return to Egypt on account of Pharaoh, Moses journeyed to Midian. The Legends of the Jews, Volume 2, by Rabbi Lewis Ginsburg Jethro In the city of Midian, named thus for a son of Abraham by Keturah, the man Jethro had lived for many years, doing a priest's service before the idols. As time went on, he grew more and more convinced of the vanity of idol worship. His priesthood became repugnant to him, and he resolved to give up his charge. He stood before his townsmen and said, Until now I performed your service before the idols, but I have grown too old for the duties of the office. Choose, therefore, whomever you would choose in my place. Speaking thus, he delivered to the people all the paraphernalia appertaining to the idol worship, and bade them transfer them to the one to whom in their discretion they should entrust his position. Suspecting Jethro's hidden motives, the people put him under the ban, and none might venture to do him the slightest service. Not even would the shepherds pasture his flocks, and there was nothing for him to do but impose this work upon his seven daughters. Jethro's transformation from an idolatrous priest into a God-fearing man is conveyed by his seven names. He was called Jether, because the Torah contained an additional section about him. Jethro, he overflowed with good deeds. Hobab, the beloved son of God. Reuel, the friend of God. Heber, the associate of God. Putiel, he that hath renounced idolatry, and Kenai, he that was zealous for God, and acquired the Torah. In consequence of the hostile relation between Jethro and the inhabitants of the city, his daughters were in the habit of making their appearance at the watering troughs before the other shepherds came thither. But the ruse was not successful. The shepherds would drive them away, and water their own flocks at the troughs that the maidens had filled. When Moses arrived in Midian, it was at the well that he made halt, and his experience was the same as Isaac's and Jacob's. Like them, he found his help meet there. Rebekah had been selected by Eleazar as the wife of Isaac, while she was busy drawing water for him. Jacob had seen Rachel first, while she was watering her sheep, and at this well in Midian Moses met his future wife, Zipporah. The rudeness of the shepherds reached its climax the very day of Moses' arrival. First they deprived the maidens of the water they had drawn for themselves, and attempted to do violence to them, and then they threw them into the water with intent to kill them. At this moment Moses appeared, dragged the maidens out of the water and gave the flocks to drink. First Jethro's, and then the flocks of the shepherds, though the latter did not deserve his good offices. True, he did them the service with but little trouble to himself, for he had only to draw a bucketful, and the water flowed so copiously that it sufficed for all the herds, and it did not cease to flow until Moses withdrew from the well the same well at which Jacob had met Rachel, his future wife, and the same well that God created at the beginning of the world, the opening of which he made in the twilight on the first Sabbath eve. Jethro's daughters thanked Moses for the assistance he had afforded them, but Moses warded off their gratitude, saying, Your thanks are due to the Egyptian I killed, on account of whom I had to flee from Egypt. Had it not been for him, I should not be here now. End of chapter 4, part 5
Moses in Egypt, Part Six, of the Legends of the Jews, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Kirsten Ferreri. The Legends of the Jews, Volume Two, by Rabbi Louis Ginsberg. Moses marries Zipporah. One of the seven maidens whom Moses saw at the well attracted his notice in particular, on account of her modest demeanour, and he made her a proposal of marriage. But Zipporah repulsed him, saying, My father has a tree in his garden with which he tests every man that expresses a desire to marry one of his daughters, and as soon as the suitor touches the tree he is devoured by it. Moses. Whence has he the tree? Zipporah. It is the rod that the Holy One, blessed be he, created in the twilight of the first Sabbath eve, and gave to Adam. He had transmitted it to Enoch, from him it descended to Noah, then to Shem, and Abraham, and Isaac, and finally to Jacob, who brought it with him to Egypt, and gave it to his son Joseph. When Joseph died, the Egyptians pillaged his house, and the rod which was in their booty they brought to Pharaoh's palace. At that time my father was one of the most prominent of the king's sacred scribes, and as such he had the opportunity of seeing the rod. He felt a great desire to possess it, and he stole it, and took it to his house. On this rod the ineffable name is graven, and also the ten plagues that God will cause to visit the Egyptians in a future day. For many years it lay in my father's house, and one day he was walking in his garden carrying it, and he stuck it in the ground. When he attempted to draw it out again, he found that it had sprouted, and was putting forth blossoms. That is the rod with which he tries any that desire to marry his daughters. He insists that our suitors shall attempt to pull it out of the ground, but as soon as they touch it, it devours them. Having given him this account of her father's rod, Zipporah went home, accompanied by her sisters, and Moses followed them. Jethro was not a little amazed to see his daughters return so soon from the watering troughs. As a rule, the chicanery they had to suffer from the shepherds detained them until late. No sooner had he heard their report about the wonder-working Egyptian than he exclaimed, Mayhap he is one of the descendants of Abraham, from whom issueth blessing for the whole world. He rebuked his daughters for not having invited the stranger that had done them so valuable a service to come into their house, and he ordered them to fetch him, in the hope that he would take one of his daughters to wife. Moses had been standing without all this time, and had allowed Jethro's daughters to describe him as an Egyptian, without protesting and asserting his Hebrew birth. For this God punished him, and caused him to die outside of the Promised Land. Joseph, who had proclaimed in public that he was a Hebrew, found his last resting place in the land of the Hebrews, and Moses, who apparently had no objection to being considered an Egyptian, had to live and die outside of that land. Zipporah hastened forth to execute her father's wish, and no sooner had she ushered him in than Moses requested her hand in marriage. Jethro replied, If thou canst bring me the rod in my garden, I will give her to thee. Moses went out, found the sapphire rod that God had bestowed on Adam when he was driven forth from paradise, the rod that had reached Jethro after manifold vicissitudes, and which he had planted in the garden. Moses uprooted it and carried it to Jethro, who conceived the idea at once that he was the prophet in Israel, concerning whom all the wise men of Egypt had foretold, that he would destroy their land and its inhabitants. As soon as this thought struck him, he seized Moses and threw him into a pit, in the expectation that he would meet with death there. And indeed he would have perished, if Zipporah had not devised a stratagem to save his life. She said to her father, Would it were thy will to hearken unto my counsel? Thou hast no wife, but only seven daughters. Dost thou desire my six sisters to preside over thy household? Then I shall go with the sheep. If not, let my sisters tend the flocks, and I shall take care of the house. Her father said, Thou hast spoken well. The six sisters shall go forth with the sheep, and thou shalt abide in the house, and take care of it, and all that belongeth to me therein. Now Zipporah could provide Moses with all sorts of dainties as he lay in the pit, and she did it for the space of seven years. At the end of this period she said to her father, I recollect that once upon a time thou didst cast into yonder pit a man that had fetched thy rod from the garden for thee, and thou didst commit a great trespass thereby. If it seemeth well to thee, uncover the pit and look into it. If the man is dead, throw his corpse away, lest it fill the house with stench. But should he be alive, then thou oughtest to be convinced that he is one of those who are wholly pious, else he had died of hunger. The reply of Jethro was, Thou hast spoken wisely. Dost thou remember his name? And Zipporah rejoined, 
I remember he called himself Moses, the son of Amram. Jethro lost no time. He opened the pit and called out, Moses, Moses. Moses replied and said, Here am I. Jethro drew him up out of the pit, kissed him, and said, Blessed be God who guarded thee for seven years in the pit. I acknowledge that he slayeth and reviveth, that thou art one of the holy pious, that through thee God will destroy Egypt in the time to come, lead his people out of the land, and drown Pharaoh and his whole army in the sea. Thereupon Jethro gave much money to Moses, and he bestowed his daughter Zipporah on him as a wife, giving her to him, on condition that the children born of the marriage in Jethro's house should be divided in two equal classes, the one to be Israelitish, the other Egyptian. When Zipporah bore him a son, Moses circumcised him and called him Gershom, as a memorial of the wonder God had done for him. For although he lived in a strange land, the Lord had not refused him aid even there. Zipporah nursed her first child for two years, and in the third year she bore a second son. Remembering his compact with Jethro, Moses realized that his father-in-law would not permit him to circumcise this one, too, and he determined to return to Egypt, that he might have the opportunity of bringing up his second son as an Israelite. On the journey thither, Satan appeared to him in the guise of a serpent, and swallowed Moses down to his extremities. Zipporah knew by this token that the thing had happened because her second son had not been circumcised, and she hastened to make good the omission. As soon as she sprinkled the blood of the circumcision on her husband's feet, a heavenly voice was heard to cry out to the serpent, commanding him, Spew him out! And Moses came forth, and stood upon his feet. Thus Zipporah saved Moses' life twice, first from the pit, and then from the serpent. When Moses arrived in Egypt, he was approached by Dathan and Abiram, the leaders of the Israelites, and they spake, Comest thou hither to slay us, or dost thou purpose to do the same with us as thou didst with the Egyptian? This drove Moses straightway back to Midian, and there he remained two years more, until God revealed himself at Horeb, and said to him, Go and bring forth my children out of the land of Egypt. The Legends of the Jews, Volume 2, by Rabbi Lewis Ginsburg A Bloody Remedy The latter years of Israel's bondage in Egypt were the worst. To punish Pharaoh for his cruelty toward the children of Israel, God afflicted him with a plague of leprosy, which covered his whole body, from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet. Instead of being chastened by his disease, Pharaoh remained stiff-necked, and he tried to restore his health by murdering Israelitish children. He took counsel with his three advisers, Balaam, Jethro, and Job, how he might be healed of the awful malady that had seized upon him. Balaam spoke, saying, Thou canst regain thy health only if thou wilt slaughter Israelitish children and bathe thy blood. Jethro, averse from having a share in such an atrocity, left the king and fled to Midian. Job, on the other hand, though he also disapproved of Balaam's counsel, kept silence, and in no wise protested against it, wherefore God punished him with a year's suffering. But afterward he loaded him down with all the felicities of this life, and granted him many years, so that this pious Gentile might be rewarded in this world for his good deeds, and not have the right to urge a claim upon the beatitude of the future life. In pursuance of the sanguinary advice given by Balaam, Pharaoh had his bailiffs snatch Israelitish babes from their mother's breasts, and slaughter them, and in the babe of these innocents he bathed. His disease afflicted him for ten years, and every day an Israelitish child was killed for him. It was all in vain. Indeed, at the end of this time his leprosy changed into boils, and he suffered more than before. While he was in this agony, the report was brought to him that the children of Israel in Goshen were garrulous and idle in their forced labor. The news aggravated his suffering, and he said, Now that I am ill, they turn and scoff at me. Harness my chariot, and I will betake myself to Goshen, and see the derision wherewith the children of Israel deride me. And they took and put him upon a horse, for he was not able to mount it himself. When he and his men had come to the border between Egypt and Goshen, the king's steed passed into a narrow place. The other horses, running rapidly through the pass, pressed upon each other until the king's horse fell while he sat upon it, and when it fell, the chariot turned over on his face, and also the horse lay upon him. The king's flesh was torn from him, for this thing was from the Lord. He had heard the cries of his people in their affliction. The king's servants carried him upon their shoulders, brought him back to Egypt, and placed him on his bed. He knew that his end was come to die, and the queen, Alfarinit, and his nobles gathered around his bed, and they wept a great weeping with him. The princes and his counsellors advised the king to make choice of a successor to reign in his stead, whomsoever he would choose from among his sons. He had three sons and two daughters by the queen Alfaranit, beside children from concubines. 
The name of his firstborn was Atro, the name of the second Adikam, and of the third Morayan. The name of the older daughter was Bethiah, and of the other Akuzit. The firstborn of the sons of the king was an idiot, precipitate and heedless in all his actions. Adikam the second son was a cunning and clever man, and versed in all the wisdom of Egypt, but ungainly in appearance, fleshy and short of stature. His height was a cubit in a space, and his beard flowed down to his ankles. The king resolved that Adikam should reign in his stead after his death. When the second son of his was but ten years old, he had given him Gedida, the daughter of Abilat, to wife, and she bore him four sons. Afterward Adikam went and took three other wives, and begot eight sons and three daughters. The king's malady increased upon him greatly, and his flesh emitted a stench like a carcass cast into the field in summer-time in the heat of the sun. When he saw that his disorder bad seized upon him with a strong grip, he commanded his son Adikam to be brought to him, and they made him king over the land in his place. At the end of three years the old king died in shame and disgrace, a loathing to all that saw him, and they buried him in the sepulchre of the kings of Egypt in Zoan. But they did not embalm him as was usual with kings, for his flesh was putrid, and they could not approach his body on account of the stench, and they buried him with haste. Thus the Lord requited him with evil for the evil he had done in his days to Israel, and he died in terror and shame after having reigned ninety-four years. Adikam was twenty years old when he succeeded his father, and he reigned four years. The people of Egypt called him Pharaoh, as was their custom with all their kings, but his wise men called him Akuz, for Akuz is the word for short in the Egyptian language, and Adikam was exceedingly awkward and undersized. The new Pharaoh surpassed his father Malol and all the former kings in wickedness, and he made heavier the yoke upon the children of Israel. He went to Goshen with his servants, and increased their labor, and he said unto them, Complete your work, each day's task, and let not your hands slacken with from the work from this day forward, as you did in the days of my father. He placed officers over them from amongst the children of Israel, and over these officers he placed taskmasters from among his servants, and he put before them a measure for bricks, according to the number they were to make day by day. And whenever any deficiency was discovered in the measure of their daily bricks, the taskmasters of Pharaoh would go to the women of the children of Israel, and take their infants from them, as many as the number of bricks lacking in the measure, and these babes they put into the building instead of the missing bricks. The taskmasters forced each man of the Israelites to put his own child in the building. The father would place his son in the wall, and cover him over with mortar, all the while weeping, his tears running down upon his child. The children of Israel sighed every day on account of their dire suffering, for they had thought that after Pharaoh's death his son would lighten their toil. But the new king was worse than his father. And God saw the burden of the children of Israel, and their heavy work, and he determined to deliver them. However, it was not for their own sake that God resolved upon the deliverance of the children of Israel, for they were empty of good deeds. And the Lord foreknew that once they were redeemed they would rise up against him, and even worship the golden calf. Yet he took mercy upon them for he remembered his covenant with the fathers, and he looked upon their repentance for their sins, and accepted their promise, to fulfill the word of God after their going forth from Egypt, even before they should hear it. After all, the children of Israel were not wholly without merits. In a high degree they possessed qualities of extraordinary excellence. There were no incestuous relations among them. They were not evil-tongued. They did not change their names. They clung to the Hebrew language, never giving it up, and great fraternal affection prevailed among them. If one happened to finish the tale of his bricks before his neighbors, he was in the habit of helping the others. Therefore God spake, They deserve that I should have mercy upon them. For if a man shows mercy unto another, I have mercy upon him. End of chapter 4, part 6